Blessed be the Lord, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Let's stand together. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the mercy and power. It is by God's design that we gather here today as His people united in His Son, Jesus of Nazareth. We celebrate this day, the day after the Passover, as the day in which Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death. We serve a risen Savior. Let us worship our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by, by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. Christ, my living hope. 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. And always be prepared to make a reason to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness tremble? Only a Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who are through him believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. 
Sovereign Lord, we humbly bow before you, the great King of kings, the uncreated one, the one who created all things, the universe, the heavens, the earth below, and each and every one of us. We give you praise and honor and glory at this time as we lift up our hearts, our souls, our mind, our strength. Help us worship you with all that we have give you everything because you have given everything for us with your son who died on the cross. Help us remember him and partake of his body and blood and lift up our souls and glorify you. Thank you for this day. 
this family, this church, and help us honor and glorify you in our service. It's in your son's most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You were despised, you were rejected. to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through his infinite wisdom and power, he is highly exalted. The name of Jesus in whom we fix our hope. Our condition was hopeless and we needed a savior. Jesus, despised and rejected, made himself the lowest of the low, so that he could then take our place. Like a sheep before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Praise be to our God and Father, for he has given the life of his one and only Son in our place. Please pray with me. Wonderful Father, it is only through you that we find salvation. Thank you, God. We could never earn or deserve the gift of your son, but oh, how grateful we are for him. Thank you for the life that he lived here in the flesh. And we remember now the body as it hung on the cross in our place. Amen.
the blood that flows in each of our veins right now contains life. Without it, we would have no life. But that life could never truly give us eternal life like the blood of Jesus. That true life comes only through that sacrifice that Jesus gave. Through his blood, we are reconciled to God. We obtain peace, forgiveness, and redemption. Uh, We are cleansed, purified, and sanctified. Through the giving of his blood, his life, he has provided life and freedom for us. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we give honor and praise to your holy name for the life we find in the blood of your son. We proclaim his death from now until he comes again and ask that you continually cover and cleanse us by this precious blood. We remember now this blood given, through, given for us through Jesus. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen.
And as if the death and the burial, the blood, the body of Jesus wasn't enough, not only has God freed us from the shackles of sin through that, he has given us hope through the resurrection of Jesus. We, like him, will rise one day. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through that resurrection. We serve a risen Savior, not a dead one. Death could not hold him. The grave could not claim him. And it will not claim us either. If we are in Christ, we are new creations and risen with him. Our God has given us Everything. We did not have this before. He has freely given it to us and paid for it for us. We have a living hope, not a dead one. We, in turn, give everything we have to him. We give our money. We give our possessions. We give our energy. We give our time. We give our bodies as living sacrifices. We give our hopes. We give our dreams. We give our struggles. We give our sin. We trade our lives for his because his is better and alive. In the end, we come away better and with so much more than we ever gave. Christ the Lord is risen, and God has highly exalted him above all else. We too are seated with him. How could we ever hold anything back? Pray with me, please. O sovereign Lord, almighty God, you hold the power over death. All glory and praise belong to you for raising your son Jesus from the grave. Thank you. Thank you for clothing us in Christ and giving us that same resurrection. We give ourselves wholly and solely to you through the power of your Holy Spirit and through your son Jesus. Amen. During this next song, our kids will come up the aisles and take a collection for the children at Eustis Heights Elementary. If you'd like to contribute to that, just hold something out into the aisle, and they'll be dismissed to go to his kids. <clears throat> this thin line of mine, you know that.
Good morning. If you're our guest this morning and you, uh, your kids just disappeared, uh, you do get them back. Please, pick them up. <laughs> oh, we are so blessed to be here today. It has already been a great day. If you got to wake up for the 6.30 sunrise service, uh, it was just awesome to be able to uh, worship as the sun rose up over the lake. It was just outstanding to be able to be with family. Uh, I know this, just as much as you know this, that it is uh, what the world, we, we talk about Easter Sunday this morning, and we're here to celebrate the risen King, but I know that that doesn't always mean that every person who walks in the door feels like celebrating, if you know what I mean. Uh, there are still things in life that are going on. It's not like Easter Sunday happens and then all of a sudden everything is just perfect. Um, you know, or we feel perfect. And I don't think that's very foreign, even to the Bible. I think that uh, many of the people who experienced the resurrection of Jesus went through these incredible ups and downs for just the past week, even just in that. So this morning, if you come to, uh, to church with us, and I'm so glad you're here, uh, I hope that you find a couple things. First, I hope that you find family. Uh, this is just, uh, this is our family. I hope that you find openness and realness because uh, nobody here is perfect, uh, except maybe the babies. I mean, that, might, that might work. Uh, but, but you look at any grown person here, uh, myself most of all, uh, nobody here is perfect. But we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and we celebrate the risen king this morning because we know that without that risen king that nothing in this world matters. And I don't know how some people live in a world that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I, was, I forget who I was talking to the other day. Oh, yes, I do remember. It was a lady at the fair. Goodness, we went to the fair. Uh, which, by the way, when it's $2 fair day, that doesn't mean you're going to spend less than $100 at the fair. Uh, if you eat the way that I eat. Uh, man, lots of fried dough and cotton candy is just really great. Um, awesome day, but uh, we sat down at the fair, and it was me and the kids, uh, and, and a lady said, hey, can, we, can I sit with you? Okay. Honestly, my first inclination is to say, uh, just kind of have a family time here. Uh, I don't want you to see me with sugar all over my mouth, that kind of thing, but, but she sat down, and we, we had a conversation, and uh, she said, do you go to church anywhere? I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. Um, and I, I told her where we went to church and all, everything. And uh, she just said, isn't it so good to, to know Jesus? And in my mind, I thought, I'm supposed to be telling you this. Uh, but I knew that, that that lady was there for this conversation that day. And, and she even asked me this question. She said, uh, she said, how do people do this life without Jesus? I mean, we were walking, we were sitting there in the middle of, Fried Dough Alley and Fried Food Alley. I mean, like, you could find everything. There's, there's literally a sign for fried bubble gum on one of the things. And, uh, and, and there's probably one where you could bring your own stuff to fry. And that's fine. But, uh, yeah, it's gross until you eat it. And it's wonderful. And it's good. Uh, but, but as we're sitting there, and there's lights and rides and music and joy. And somebody's selling a cow over on the side or something like that. Or a pig or goat. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, all that just seemed like joy, but what we have to understand is even though things look like joy, not everything is joy. That even in our times where we act the best and we put on the best show, that it doesn't always feel the best. And I'm so grateful for the risen King because of all that. I want you to imagine with me this morning uh, the scene that was set. What was going on the week of the resurrection before the resurrection actually happened. If I were to mention emptiness to you, I know that doesn't always bring about the best connotation. We talk about the empty tomb, and it was, it's, kind of ironic, it's kind of weird to think about, is that the empty tomb still left room for sorrow. 
It wasn't the fact that the tomb was empty that allowed people to be joyful. Uh, We'll see in just a moment, even Mary sat there at the empty tomb and wept because the emptiness didn't mean anything was alive. Somebody could have stolen the body. Somebody could have gone in and taken Jesus' body away and left the grave cloth there. It didn't mean anything. It just meant that the tomb was empty. And you and I would know very much today that emptiness is not always the thing that, that indicates life. Because there might be somebody here today that feels incredibly empty, but will walk away from here not knowing what real life really is like. And so emptiness is not the indication of something outstanding. Emptiness still leaves room for sorrow. You imagine the apostles and the followers of Jesus at this time, who have followed Jesus for three years of their lives. I mean, given up everything given up their jobs, given up their time with family, given up uh, the ability sometimes to even provide for their families in the way that they, they know how to. And they have given three years of their lives to Jesus. And he's been an incredible teacher. And he's done incredible things. They've seen him heal people. They've seen him cast demons out of people. They have seen so many incredible things. And what that's doing in them is just bolstering up this hope that really the king is here, right? Really the king is here. But in that perspective they had, we know that it wasn't the perspective that Jesus really needed them or wanted them to have because they're expecting an earthly king to walk in uh, to Jerusalem or or to be a part of uh, overthrowing Rome and to set up an earthly kingdom right here on this earth. So imagine going from ministry with Jesus where you're seeing victory after victory and in John chapter 12, imagine uh, the, the, uh, the triumphal entry. And imagine that feeling at this point, you know as a follower of Jesus, oh, it's time. It's about to go down. Right? That, that the king is finally walking into Jerusalem. And not only that, but look at who is, who is recognizing the king. I mean, people are coming out of their homes and putting these palm branches down on the ground to welcome the king. But things are a little different. He's not coming in on a, on a valiant white horse. What's he riding into town? Oh, just a lowly donkey. And he's not coming in with an army. But what's he coming in with? Fishermen and tax collectors and, uh, and sinners and, and you name it. Uh, the total opposite of what they're expecting at this time. And so things are a little different, but, but if you're a follower of Jesus' at this time, man, this is, this is it. This is where Jesus is about to walk into Jerusalem and he's about to tear the walls down. It's when he's about to reclaim his rightful place on the throne and he is going to rule with power and free those who are captive. And then they're in the garden. And Jesus is arrested. And man, we see Peter, I mean, he's a follower, isn't he? He's like kind of the Dan Huther of the group. I mean, this is the truth. You know it. You know it. Uh, he knows it. Uh, I'm kind of like the John. I'd be faster. But he would be like the guy with the sword. But Peter takes out the, his sword, and, and, and you know, he, he's ready to defend the king. But Jesus rebukes him at that time and it's all confused and and stuff's going on and 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 Jesus is taken away he's arrested and then you see the king stand trial and never ever uh, really give defense for anything he allows his accusers to talk Uh, he, he 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 makes a pretty bold statement when Pilate says are you a king and what does Jesus say he says I am oh I'm king And for this very purpose, I came to this earth. Pilate walks away. He says, there's nothing. I can't bring any charge against this man. But he leaves it up to the crowd. And imagine this. The crowd that was there that day would have probably been the same crowd that was laying palms down just a few days later as he was entering into Jerusalem. And now that same crowd is crying out, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Let him loose and crucify the king. Can you imagine if you're a disciple at that time, the ups and the downs that you'd experience? I mean, the excitement from the entry, the confusion and all the trial. Why is he letting this happen to him? 
And then, of course, we see, as we celebrated on Friday, we talked about on Friday a lot with our families, the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're not going to get into all of everything that happened at that moment, but imagine the ups and the downs from excitement to confusion to sadness as they see the one that they invested their lives in, the one who was supposed to be king, the one that was supposed to reign forever and fix everything, is now nailed to the cross and is breathing his last breath. Or at least that's what you'd think. Right? That's what I would think. Can you imagine that Saturday? (laughs) Can you imagine after investing like you did and experiencing all you did and the hope that you had at that time, and after Jesus was taken down from the cross and put into the grave, because that's where dead men go, what that next day would feel like? Some people call it quiet Saturday (laughs) or silent Saturday. What would be going through your mind? We know that some people went back to their old lives. I mean, the next time you see Peter after that, where is he? He's on a fishing boat. Went back to whatever he knew he was to do for his family. But I want to pick up this morning in John chapter 20 and verse 11. And we're not going to read all of John chapter 20, but we're going to talk about a lot of it this morning. Sorry, we're going to, we're going to actually go to chapter, or verse 1. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who loved Jesus, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. And so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, thanks John, and and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. When the linen cloths lying there, sorry, he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, again, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples did what? They went back to their homes. And just a second, we're going to see that, we're, like, where do we find Mary? They, they find an empty tomb, but Mary's still in sorrow. The disciples see that, that there's no one there. <laughs> But what's their first thought? Somebody took Jesus. We don't know where he is. Somebody took him. But in verses 11 through 18, here's what we see. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stood and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And listen, I don't know what's happening right here. Like, uh, how would you not know it was Jesus question? I, I, I hear that a lot. It's possible that she was just weeping so much that she saw someone there and just didn't know who it was. It's possible. You ever seen somebody in the wrong context? And you just, like, I know that person, but I don't know that person. There's a possibility if I've run into you in the grocery store and not here, I probably did that to you. I hope not. But there are times, especially when people are wearing masks, you're like, I know those eyes from somewhere, but I just don't know who that is. <laughs> right? And, uh, and it's possible something like that is, is happening here where, where she knew that Jesus was in the grave. And guess where you don't usually see people who died and were buried? Like standing right there in front of you, walking around. And so maybe just the context isn't right. And so Mary, he's there, but she doesn't recognize who he is. But she does talk to him a minute. Because Jesus says, woman, why are you you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Like, who are you looking for? And then she just thought he was the gardener. So she said to him, Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him. I'll take care of him. And Jesus gives the shortest sermon and just a word to Mary when he simply says, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Teacher, teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to the brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Church, the empty tomb was an empty tomb. But it wasn't until an encounter with the risen king that it started to change people's lives. If we could walk real quick through about three different cases, we're not going to read every single one of them, but I want to imagine what Jesus, the risen king, can do with your situations in your life today. We talked about emptiness. And emptiness, does, you know how that feels. So many of you in, in either broken relationships or situations that just haven't uh, worked out the way that you thought they'd work out, or, or, or you name it, they're there. Emptiness is a very real feeling. This sorrow is a very real feeling. Mary Magdalene had just lost the teacher. All the disciples had just lost the teacher. And what, does she, what is the emotion that she feels at that time? Even though the grave was empty, she was in sorrow. She was in sorrow. i got to ask you to consider today this, is that the risen king takes care of sorrow simply by calling your name. And I don't know, uh, that, that sounds really abstract, and I understand that. Uh, and and I, I don't mean we're going to sit here waiting for somebody to say, Steph, right? Or we're not going to say, uh, we're not wait here and somebody say, hey, Kira. And, and that will be the risen king. But we have to understand that a dead king can't do anything about this, but a risen king can walk into your life and say, I know exactly who you are. And this morning, there are many of us who are experiencing things like sorrow. And we've got to understand that a king that was on the cross that died, uh, could, and, and the story ended there, that could have done something for your sin, but it could never have done something for your sorrow. But a risen king, the one who overcame the grave by the power of the Spirit of God, can know your name today, be familiar with who you are, and speak life and joy into your sorrow. I want to think about this morning the encounters. Because the disciples in verses 19 and following have a very different encounter. In verses 19 through 23, you see the disciples, and, and, and just listen to verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being what? They're locked. Remember the good old days where you didn't have to lock your door? I don't. I mean, I was never lived it in that time. Uh, sometimes we forget to lock the door. <laughs> That's always fun. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I can ever just leave my door unlocked and walk away. Some of you might live in neighborhoods where that is, uh, and, and that's cool, uh, but not me. I remember one time we went on, uh, vac uh, Bethany and I, before we had kids, we were going on vacation. Uh, I think we were going to Italy uh, because you can do that stuff before you have kids. And, um, and so we went, and uh, the morning we left, as we were leaving, the SWAT team was breaking down a door about three doors down at three in the morning. To which, after seeing that, my wife said, did you lock the door? <laughs> you only lock the door for certain reasons, right? Like, what, is a, what does an unlocked door say? Come on in. Come on in. Like, if you show up to the Hooters house at 6.30 tonight, there will be an open door unlocked. Uh, just come on in. What does a locked door say? It either says, I'm not coming out, or you're not coming in. Right? Um, now, if you knock on the door, that's different. Somebody unlocks it, uh, hopefully. Hopefully. But, uh, but we know that can even be the case. They are locking the door not because they don't, well, it's a little of both, but think about the fear that might be going on in the disciples at this time. 
I mean, if their very leader, if their king had been killed, guess who else might be able to be implicated in this great crime? It would have been the disciples as well. And so there's great fear that is in the disciples at this time. In verses 19 through 23, we understand this, but Jesus comes in. Like he walks into the house and he says to them, peace be with you. Now shalom is kind of like one of those one of those customary greetings, but it wasn't just like a hey, how you doing? What Jesus is able to do at this time, he does it twice in this one little, uh, one little uh, account, is he, li- he gives his peace upon that house. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side. What's he showing them? Hey, it's really me. <laughs> I'm not a lookalike. I'm not somebody pretending to be your king. Uh, I'm him. So look at my side. Look at my hands. It is all true. And when he said this, i uh, sorry, then the disciples were glad when they saw Jesus. And he said to them again, peace be with you. Then he tells them to do something that is so different than a locked door. Because a locked door says fear, but Jesus says, uh, I'm sending you out. He says, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine the, the change from fear to power. Imagine the change from fear to mission once again. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Church, the risen king takes care of fear by offering his peace. When we have the ability to understand that not a dead king, but one who is very much alive today, he has the ability to take care of even your fear if you'll just receive his peace. And fast forwarding a little bit, Jesus encounters a man named Thomas. And many of you know Thomas, right? What do we usually call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. And why will we call him Doubting Thomas? He gets a bad rap, but he probably acts a lot like many of us would act at that time, right? Uh, because he hears, he has not yet seen Jesus, but he hears that Jesus is back from the dead. I mean, who else in, in the history of time have they heard that about? Maybe Lazarus. They, they've seen it happen. That was by the power of Jesus at that time. But, but, but it happening without Jesus, it would have been so weird. It would have been so odd. Uh, and and we've got to ask that, like, you've got to see from their perspective at this time. What do you mean that the man that was arrested, the man that was put on the cross, and the man that was put on the tomb is back? And so Thomas gives a, an answer, or at least a stipulation, that, that might seem unreasonable, but it's really not unreasonable. When he says, I will believe, but I'll only believe when, once I feel the holes in his hands, and once I can feel the holes in his side. Now, I don't know about you, if I'm Thomas, uh, I'm not wanting to touch any of that. But he needed proof. He needed proof. And as Jesus encounters Thomas, eight days after Thomas makes those remarks. In verse 26, here's what happens. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so that brings us to you and I today. Blessed is the one who does not see but yet believes. You know, back when Lazarus was, was, ra- was in the tomb, you'll remember one of his sisters had this conversation with Jesus. 
when Jesus basically says, uh, he says he'll, he'll rise up again. And she turns to him and says, yeah, I know he'll rise up again in the last days. I know he'll rise up again in the last days. But what does Jesus tell her? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then what, what the, the sisters were thinking could only happen in the last days happens in that day when Lazarus walks out of the tomb after being dead for multiple days and he walks out of the tomb because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And the main thing that I want to proclaim to you today before we leave from this room is that Jesus, the risen King, gives us hope for eternity. And as it was mentioned already today, gives us hope for a life everlasting. But there are times where we, just like Lazarus' sisters, only believe in the life that is to come for eternity. And we fail to understand and believe that Jesus, the risen King, can do something for you today. Well, what does that really mean? Look at what John says. (laughs) I love that he makes this statement. Look at what John says in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have Life in his name. An empty tomb would have left you with the ability to have emptiness. We notice it because Mary was still at the tomb crying. Because an empty tomb could have meant so much. But praise God, the story wasn't left at just an empty tomb. The story was, well, it never stopped, did it? <laughs> it never stopped. But the story at that time was, was kind of concluded with not an empty tomb, but an encounter with the risen king, the one who had overcome death, the one that had power over sorrow, the one that had power over, or peace over fear, and the one that had, uh, had power over doubts and, and those kinds of things. Man, you mention those things right now in this world, and what is, what's relatable there? You think anybody, anybody in our world is experiencing sorrow? I mean, over and over, walk out the door or look around, there's sorrow even in the room. You think anybody in this world experiences fear? Oh, goodness. I mean, the fear that cripples us so often. I mean, in so many different ways. Fear that can keep us in our homes. Fear that can keep us away from relationship. Fear that keeps us just crippled emotionally. It is all there and it is all very real. I mean, think about the fear, the disciples. What was Jesus like? The whole purpose for him like having them and teaching them was so they can be sent out and, and, and teach more people and make more disciples. But at the, very, at the very instance of fear, their mission was just collapsed. So they find themselves in locked doors and they're not telling anybody about, about Jesus and, and the ministry that he had did. But when the risen king appears, boy, mission is on. Because Jesus can even speak into fears today. And Jesus can speak into sorrow. And Jesus can even speak into doubt. I know doubt's not one of those things you want to talk about in church because we should all be here and just per- have perfect belief, right? Right? We should never question anything, and we should never, uh, never ever experience times of doubt. But spend some time with people who are real and open, and you'll understand that doubt's still a very real thing today. We have conversations that are open and honest, and, and you even have questions like, why did, why did God have to do it that way? Or, or, or do we really believe this? Like, some, can we be honest? A risen king seems outrageous. Why? Everybody I've known who died and was buried is dust right now. It's it's incredible. It's supernatural. It is out of this world. It is unexplainable without faith. It is so incredible. But these things are given not just so that you can have life for an eternity, but so you can have life right now. 
the risen king means so much for you and for me. I'm reminded of a song that we often sing, and we, I don't even, we might even sing it today. I'm not sure. Uh, we are singing it today. Uh, man, it's just incredible how God works things out uh, or how those who plan out our services. Uh, it's, it's both. It's both. It's God. Thank you, Cliff. There's a song that we sang. I've sang this song so long, like for so long as, a, as being a kid growing up in church. And if I'm honest with you, I sang it, and I, and I, I know what it says. I could recite the words to you. But it's not a song that, that I always just internalize, and it meant a whole lot for me. But we're going to sing it today. Cliff, is it, is it the next song? No, it's the next song. It's actually our song of invitation that we'll have. And listen, for, for an invitation today, I just want to ask, could you, wherever you are and however you can, just respond to the risen king? Our lives will feel like death sometimes. <laughs> our lives will feel like emptiness sometimes. We will experience fear sometimes. We will experience doubt. And we will experience sorrow. And I know this sounds incredibly abstract. And I don't mean it to sound this way. It sounds big and maybe unattainable at times. But the only way any of that gets taken care of is if Jesus appears on that third day. When it wasn't just emptiness, but there was life. That the dead body that sat in that tomb started to breathe again. That the blood started to course through his veins once again. And that he walked out of that tomb triumphant. Can I be honest with you? If I walk out of that tomb, I'm strutting out of that tomb. You know what I mean? Like, I know Jesus had power, and they experienced it that day, but can you imagine walking out of the tomb if you're Jesus? Hey, not, there's a good thing I'm, I wasn't that, because uh, I would have done things totally different, because I'm not Jesus. Uh, but if I just conquered a grave, boy, look out, because you're about to find out about it. There's no way there's a lady in the garden that's about to confuse me as the gardener. <laughs> Right? Because I'm about to say, look who it is. <laughs> I just beat the grave. And, and man, it, it, there's going to be banners and, and all kinds of stuff. But Jesus just, he, he takes it one by one. Or, or small group by small group. And he starts to appear. Why? Because every single group there needed something different from him at that time. I know everybody in this room needs something different, maybe at this one time. We all need the salvation that Jesus brings. We are all dead in our sin. And there's nothing we could do about it on our own. And we all need a way to get back to God. That's why Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection gave us the ability to do the same. Romans 6 says that. That we, how, uh, we can die to sin, be buried in baptism as we're buried in a grave, and we can raise up to new life. And in baptism, our sins can be washed away and the gift of the Holy Spirit is to come. It's an incredible thing that Jesus has given us the ability to participate in the gospel that is his gospel. And you might be here this morning and you've never responded to that gospel and being baptized into Christ and being raised up into new life. And we want to give you that opportunity today. But I know that everybody here might need something just a little bit different apart from just the salvation. Because you might be here experiencing fear. And guess what? Jesus walked into that disciple's house and with locked doors said, peace be with you. And I hope today that you can experience the peace that the risen king can give to you. And you might be experiencing sorrow over something so far out of your control. And I understand that things happen in this world that we cannot control, and they bring up things in us. Sorrow or fear or anger, and you name it. And Jesus deals with Mary just one-on-one. -on -one. He says, uh, he just simply says one word, Mary. Just Mary. Mary. And I hope today, if you're, so, if you're struggling with sorrow or fear, you can just in some way understand that Jesus knows exactly who you are. And he can, he can just say, hey, uh, I'm not going to say anybody's name, because <laughs> he can say, hey, Kenny. And no matter what I'm dealing with, he can lift my head up from sorrow and say, Kenny, you're mine, and I'm yours. And you can experience doubt, and that might be what you're dealing with. But man, Jesus can walk right into the room and say, it's me, and I'm real, and I'm here. I know what you're thinking. 
What do you mean he's going to walk right into this room and let me touch and let me feel? But John says it so clearly is that the words that he wrote down, the words that he recorded, are for a reason. Yeah, I believe it was in Luke's writings. He talked about why he wrote and how he wrote. And he said, this stuff, I have labored over it to make sure it was true. <laughs> like I've talked to firsthand accounts, the people who experienced it all right then, and I have checked every detail. Luke was a physician, so you know he was checking details. Uh, like he, he said, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm checking it, I'm checking it, so that you can know what you're reading is true. And what does John say? He says, I'm giving this to you so that you can believe and that you can have life. And I simply want you to know today that when you walk out these doors, we walk out serving not a dead king, but we serve one that lives today. And so what does that mean? We're going to sing it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. In church, a dead man can't hold the future. But because I know who holds the future, this life is worth the living just because Jesus lives. He lived on that third day, and he lives today. And this life is still worth the living just because he lives. Let's stand and let's sing together. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. Matthew uh, chapter 28, uh, verse 5. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. He is not here. He has risen. Shall we pray? 
Our Father, we're so thankful for um, this day and for the, the many blessings that you uh, continually uh, bless upon us each and every day. Help us to always remember the, the risen King changes everything, changes everything in our lives, and help us to always recognize that. As we uh, have gathered uh, today, uh, we always want to remember the supreme sacrifice of our, our beautiful King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, as we praise uh, you this morning, we help us to live in the, in the wonder of your goodness and your endless grace. We always want to give you the glory and honor for all that you're doing in our lives each day. We marvel as you shine your light in us, through us, and over us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and purpose. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What a day to be together. Amen. A couple of announcements before we dismiss. Attendance cards. If you haven't filled one out from the pew, you can grab one from the back of the pew in front of you. Orange ones are for members, green ones for visitors. Visitors, there are so many of you here today. We are so glad to see you. So glad to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, 242 life groups. Some of them are meeting, some of them are not. If you don't know, check with your group leader. If you aren't uh, familiar with our 242 life groups, let me tell you, those are the place to get to know us. Um, that's an opportunity to really get together with a group of us and share life together. That's why we call them our life groups. So if you're curious and want some more information about those, please let us know. We'd be happy to tell you about them. We have a quick, uh, quick card here from the Tillery family. Dear Orange Avenue family, Susan and I would like to thank our church family for all the prayers, messages, and cards we received when my father passed away. Orange Avenue has been a part of the Tillery family since it was in Orange Grove and its inception. We love you all and ask that you continue to pray for us and my mother and Tillery. In Christian love, Doug and Susan Tillery. And finally, bulletin. If you haven't gotten one lately, there's copies out on the table in the, in the foyer. You can get them in your email. You can get them in your text messages if you aren't... Uh, aren't reading those, please check up on that. There's a lot going on, a lot of requests, and a lot of information to know about our church family in the bulletins. Thank you for being here. God, who said, let, shine, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus, or excuse me, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Let's all stand together. <laughs> no, know we already sung it, but we're going to sing it again. <laughs> Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us let the praises of the king rise among us let it rise let it rise let the songs of the lord rise among us let the songs of the lord rise among us let the joy of
Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of Rise! 